Okay, yeah, it's been a good couple of days of a lot of talking. I can feel it a bit uh, uh, in my voice. So hopefully we all survived this last hour. I'm probably, I'm a bit tired. I'm sure you guys are a bit tired. Uh, so let's um, join forces and uh, help each other over the finishing line. Um, okay, so today I've got, uh, in a way, a very much a pretty just straightforward presentation. I just want to keep it um, nice and simple and easy and formal, uh, just some, some kind of practical information. We're going to talk about foliar spraying and, and, and basics of foliar spraying and basics of plant nutrition. How do we bring these two pieces of the puzzle together with understanding spray technologies, etc., understanding plant nutrition to then bring these two things together to actually get a good response from a foliar spray and achieve uh, better mineral uh, uptake and correction of deficiencies or optimization of plant health, etc., through the use of foliars. So that's uh, the topic for today. The flow is we're going to kind of pretty much start with sprays and, and uh, principles of uptake and, and the spray technology side of things. Then I'll just kind of run through some pretty quick plant nutrition. We're going to go through each element one by one. Again, it's not a, we've only got an hour. It's not a super detailed course. So just a, a, you know, a key message for each mineral, kind of a, a good memory kind of jog for you all. And then we'll kind of uh, bring that all together at the end. So um, I've managed to, if you, for those of you who were here yesterday, my screen went all, all over the place, so I made sure I corrected that today, and I've got my, photo, my favorite photosynthesis slide, which is also nicely laid out. So this is what it was supposed to look like yesterday, the ingredients for our photosynthesis driving the processes of plant growth, energy, air, water, minerals, all driving photosynthesis and life. And uh, this is, of course, the focus, what we're going to zoom in today, talk about how do we manage plant nutrition, how do we manage those minerals. Normally, there's a big discussion to have about how do we manage that from the soil health perspective and the soil delivery of those minerals. But today, we're just going to kind of focus a little bit more on the, the foliar uh, side of things. And hooray, there we go, it's working today as well. And so this is just then a little bit more detail of exactly the same thing. We're talking about photosynthesis, bringing in carbon dioxide, fixing that carbon, producing that first product of photosynthesis, that sugar, uh, glucose molecule. And in, in the yellow, the writing here, this is, this is our job as nutritionists. It's to optimize the minerals, the nutritional availability, the mineral balances in the plant. It's our job to optimize that so that they can be enzymes or catalysts to catalyze this process take carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, stitch it together into sugars in the presence of those mineral drivers. And then what does the plant do with that very simple sugar, that first building block? Again, it requires adequate supply of nutrition to drive and build complexity and diversity into the plant. So we stitch those little sugars together to form bigger chain carbohydrates now. Uh, tack tacking on some nitrogen and sulfur, forming some amino acids and some proteins, building more and more complexity, fats and oils, waxes, um, Q2, the waxy layers, uh, lignans, tannins, all these kinds of other compounds, hormones, vitamins, uh, phytonutrients, protect defense chemicals, protective chemicals, etc. Um, all of these kinds of things that all come from that very first building block, that simple sugar molecule. But in that second stage, we build complexity and diversity. And this is, for those of you that were sitting in with Dan's session just next door last, this is also what he was so eloquently also talking about. It's building in this complexity that is the driver of inherent pest and disease resistance. And I'll, I'll come return to the slide with it, linking that point. This is quality, this is shelf life, this is flavor, this is also pest and disease resistance. These things are intertwined, they are one and the same thing. When we optimize plant nutrition for growth, for yield, for production, for shelf life, we're also at the same time optimizing nutrition for health, for quality, for pest and disease resistance. It's all the same thing because it is all about getting the right balance of minerals to catalyze this process. And that slide there is the essence of plant health. For me, that is the definition of plant health. We've had lots of uh, difficult discussions about defining soil health the past few days. For me, this represents plant health. That's it. And our job is right here in gold, in yellow. And then when we optimize that full plant potential and production and health and quality and vitality stems from that, yields from that. 
And that means taking a balanced view of plant nutrition, looking at the bigger picture, not narrowing it down, not, not simplifying the process to ammonium nitrate with maybe a little bit of sulfur, maybe some lime here or there. You know, what is the actual limiting factor that is limiting your potential? What happens if we put more ammonium nitrate on this soil? Hmm. <laughs> this picture says yield, but it could be anything. Potential. If you, whatever your goal is, are you trying to get more roots? Do you want more nitrogen fixation, more nodules? Do you want more leaves? Do you want more branches? Do you want more protein? Do you want more shelf life, storability? It doesn't matter, you name it, flavor, quality, whatever it is you're trying to drive, and the okay, case says yield here, you won't achieve it unless you address the limiting factor. And that's why we have to widen the lens. PK and MG and pH are important, but there's also these other things that are also really important, and they may in fact be the limiting factor, and we won't pick up on that unless we are in some way looking for it, monitoring it. So then we have lovely images like this, which of course represents everything that is wrong with how we view plant nutrition, soil and plant nutrition today. This is the wrong way to be thinking about it. Here I am saying that something is more important than the other. That nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium are of primary importance. Oh, and then there's these secondary things. Oh, and then there's these tertiary things down the bottom. Uh, nothing is superior. Nothing is inferior. They're all of equal importance. Sure, nitrogen and potassium are required in greater quantities, but the trace elements in much lower quantities, but they can still have equal and significant impact over photosynthesis, driving that slide we saw earlier. This is the wrong way to be thinking about it. We want to think something more like this. Uh, no one is at the head of the table now. They're, we're trying to understand also these relationships between minerals. It's not okay to look at just the one mineral. We have to understand its relationship to other minerals. It's the balances between them that becomes much more of a driving factor there. And okay, I'm not gonna, we're, we, we're not gonna talk about this slide in, in detail at all today. We could for a long time talk about these various antagonisms and synergisms. I'm gonna give a few examples of this as we go through each mineral by mineral. But it's a useful chart that you can look at. Look at your soil tests, identify where the excesses are, use this chart to say, okay, I have an excess of whatever it may be, phosphorus. I can look at the chart and say, what will that excess of phosphorus antagonize the availability and uptake of? and that's based on whatever it's pointing to. So high phosphorus will shut down zinc, for example, shut down iron, for example. Yeah, so it's a, it is a useful chart. It's not the be all and end all, it has its critics. Some people uh, aren't on board with this chart. It's, it's, you know, again, it's a useful guide to me. I think it has its merits uh, in helping us just refine our nutrient management and balances. So what is then the role of a foliar? Uh, certainly I'm not here today to say that uh, we can substitute the role of uh, so good soil management with a foliar and, and we can do everything we need to do with foliars. Certainly not saying that, but they can be a useful tool to complement, to work with long-term soil improvement strategies. We can use foliars to augment, to, to um, come together and support our soil strategies. So why might we use a foliar spray, for example? Okay, and, and again, I didn't have time to go through it in detail, but there's all of these antagonisms and issues in soils. Minerals lock up with each other, they antagonize. We could talk about that for a long time, but um, that's stuff I've done before, if you've listened to me, or there's, there's information out there on that. But we can bypass some of those issues, uh, those antagonisms, those lockups, and get the minerals directly straight into the plant. So it has a certain real advantage there in terms of avoiding that, those issues. And that also brings with it when soil applied minerals, of course, they're more prone to leaching, particularly our nitrates, of course, volatilization, our urea, our ammonia, of course. So we help to avoid some of those issues when we're going straight into the plant. Uh, we know that our soil applied nutrients are certainly nowhere near as efficient as foliar applied. Uh, we do see a lot of nutrient losses from soil applied nutrient, uh, soil applied fertilizers, nitrogen being particularly um, notorious there. So we can bypass these issues, minimize some of these losses, and uh, that improves efficiencies, and all of this means we can come together and also use less fertilizer. So this is all helping to drive nutrient use efficiencies here. It's very small amounts of 
um, nutrients that we apply on the foliar. And sure, that's one of its limitations, and we'll, I'm going to come to some pros and cons at the end. We have, there's a maximum, there's a limit we can put out through the foliar, uh, sure, but it also in terms of it being more targeted, uh, using less, improving efficiencies, we don't need as much. And so it can have a really good complement, as I say, to our soil-based strategies. So we target those directly onto the plant surfaces where they can then be absorbed. So then we want to understand then that certain nutrients support each other and they are synergists and other nutrients can be more antagonistic towards each other uh, and prevent utilize uptake or utilization into the plant. So a few little definitions there. Synergism, this is where a nutrient interaction is synergistic, where the yield due to the combined application of those two nutrients is more than the yield expected if we were to apply them individually. So an example I give you here is one plus one is three. When those two things come together, there's a synergy there that creates an overyield, a greater response than the sum of those parts. Whereas, okay, obvious antagonism is the opposite. It's where those nutrient antag um, interactions are antagonistic and the yield uh, due to that combined application is then often driven down than what we'd expect from the individual application of the, the two individual nutrients. So, for example, one plus one, we might only get a 1.5 response. Okay, so there's some kind of a lockup there, some kind of an interference effect due to that antagonism. Or lastly, we can have zero interaction. Okay, and that would be one plus one equals two. It's, it's neither here nor there. Um, it's just fairly uh, negligible, neutral. So then we can talk about breaking down into these antagonisms. Well, why do certain nutrients antagonize each other? What is the mechanisms? What is the process that we see here? And it's really due to the similarity in certain minerals. They have certain similarities either in the size of the uh, of the element, or the size of its ionic radius, or its chemical charge, the chemistry of that mineral. And it's these two factors whereby nutrients can then begin to compete and antagonize with each other. So there's kind of two things to think about here. One is this competition. This is where we have things like a cation and a cation, a, a positively charged nutrient and a positively charged nutrient that kind of look similar to the plant. Uh, if one is simply overcrowding the other, it's a bit like a seesaw. If one is overcrowding, it's dominated there, it will suppress the uh, availability of the other due to this similarity, this competition effect. And then we have more of a lockup, where there we have cations and anions then coming together, positive and a negative coming together, forming insoluble, unavailable compounds, so locking each other up, reducing the availability of both of those. So, okay, sodium and potassium is one example back there, and calcium and phosphorus, another example here where they're locking up, forming an unavailable compound, calcium phosphate, for example. So competition due to similarity, but then also these lock-up effects. And if we think about, well, in terms of optimizing this response that we get from a foliar spray, there's a lot to uh, actually consider, to factor in when working towards a good response from our foliar sprays. There's many steps in the process, I guess I'm trying to say here. It begins with formulation, what is it we're going to spray, then we have to atomize that solution, so get it into a um, misting uh, format that can be targeted towards the plant surfaces. Uh, it has to be then transported to those plant surfaces. The droplet has to reach the leaf surface. What is the impact of that? Does it stick on the leaf? Does it bounce off? Does it fall off? What is the spread of the retention, therefore retention there? But what is the spreading capacity of, that, of the, the spray solution over the leaf surface? Do we see any residues that can um, form and suppress uptake? Then we have to actually absorb those minerals into the leaf, so penetration in. Uh, and then finally, the plant has to actually utilize that mineral, metabolize it, and convert it into a form for plant processes. So there's actually a lot of factors there that go into a simple foliar spray. And all of these things can then begin to impact the effectiveness of that foliar spray. So let's tease out just a couple of particular important uh, aspects that can uh, drive the efficacy of our spray. Again, it's some characteristics of the formulation that I want to touch on, application, environment, and the plant characteristics itself. So formulation, uh, it's about what is it we're mixing up. Uh, for example, of course, is it the right form? Uh, what are the synergists? What are the antagonists? It's about making a good mixture, so that formulation. The size of the molecule, is it a large compound that can't be absorbed by the leaf surfaces? Is it small that can be absorbed through the leaf surfaces? So what is the size of the material we're trying to apply? 
What is its solubility? What is its availability? What is the charge? Again, this is through the cations and anions. What is the electrical charge of our, of our solution? Uh, what is the pH of that solution? This can also have a big impact over uh, the effectiveness of those sprays. And again, the surface tension. How well does that spread over the leaf surface or does it bead and stick together? Do we get good spreadability across that leaf surface? And then we have things like adjuvants that can help us optimize that uh, formulation uh, aspects. So we have activator adjuvants, and these are other substances we can add to the spray mix, which, which simply enhance the activity of the active ingredient. They, they work directly in changing the behavior of the activity of the, of the actual uh, active ingredient. And that's different from our uh, utility adjuvants, these auxiliary ones, where more so we then are adding things to modify the overall other characteristics of the spray solution, not necessarily changing the behavior or the activity of the active, but other uh, solution characteristics. So adding, for example, compatibility agents or buffering solutions, uh, pH modifiers, these kinds of things. Okay, so then there's the application of the product itself, of that formulation. So, of course, nozzle sizes and nozzle um, forms and types, uh, all of these things which influence, therefore, the droplet size and then the behavior of that droplet. Is it small? Is it easily to blow off in the wind? Is it a bit too big and coarse? Will it drop to the ground? How do we find that happy medium to optimize the, the size of the droplet so that it reaches the target through that foliar, uh, during that foliar application? Uh, similarly, does that droplet land on the leaf and stay there? So does it get deflected? Does it stick on? Any runoff, any drift? These kinds of other environmental factors here, evaporation, I'll come to those in a little bit more detail. Surface area coverage, what is the size of our canopy of the leaf surfaces? What is the size, the shape, the orientation? All of these characteristic, plant characteristics that can also drive how well the plant captures that foliar spray. And so the environmental characteristics are also really, really important. Humidity, uh, so when we have very low humidity, uh, of course, we get rapid drying, and if, particularly for our soluble solutions, they can actually recrystallize, they can unsolubilize, they can recrystallize out of solution and form little crystals on the leaf surfaces. So, of course, it's now not soluble, it cannot be absorbed by the plant. So, a little bit of extra humidity there helps to maintain the solubility uh, of our spray solution when it's on that leaf surface. Uh, temperature also, so we know the plants grow and utilize nutrients more when it's warmer, so I think everything just shuts down when it's colder, so if we have a, a, an optimum temperature there where plants are growing and active, then they, you will see better um, response from those foliar sprays. Up to a top end, of course, when it starts to get too hot, again, plant processes slow down, photosynthesis shuts down uh, if it's too hot, and thereby limiting the potential of the uh, efficacy of our foliar spray. Light also plays a role, quality and quantity seems to also have a role in improving uptake and of course other things like uh, wind, um, the environment, the climate, the rain, all of these other things that are happening outside in the environment there. So, okay, I was touching there on humidity, therefore the message here is that we, we know that plants will be able to absorb and utilize the minerals that we apply if, if they are applied in the early morning or in that late afternoon. That is certainly the better time, particularly because stomata are open at that time of the day, in the morning, in the, e in the evenings. They'll be more likely to be closed on a hot day. And, um, well, as I'll talk about in a second, the stomata are one means of delivery to get those nutrients into the plant. So when the stomata have closed, of course, we're limiting that potential for nutrient uptake through the stomata. So uh, time of day is important. And then things, again, like environment and drought situations. So actually, under early drought stress, when the plant is beginning to uh, feel the effects of dry soil and it's limiting, uh, having a limited nutrient uptake from the soil, in those early stages of drought stress, of moisture stress, plants uh, actually respond very well to foliars. Part of, the, part of the stress that we're seeing, part of the dehydration and the effects and the leaf curling, et cetera, that we see in the early stages is, is also a mineral deficiency. It's the soil drying out and the plants not being able to get the minerals out of the soil water. So what you see and what we consider as uh, dry moisture stress is moisture stress plus nutrient stress because of the inability to scavenge those minerals. And in that stage, plants are, uh, foliar applications are very effective at helping the plant overcome that drought stress by, of course, 
getting the mineral directly into the plant, avoiding that dry soil. <clears throat> so they're actually, it's a very effective time during that early drought stress. However, again, as that progresses and the plants become more and more stressed, uh, really shutting down, then they become very unresponsive to a foliar spray in the later stages of that drought stress. So it can be a very effective tool to help certainly tie the plant over, see the plant over, hoping that we may still get some rain, that maybe rain could be another week away or a few days away. It can really help the plant hold on for longer. And potassium is a nutrient there that's particularly that's relevant for. Potassium really shuts down quickly as the soil begins to dry out. And you get a good health recovery from the plant, in the plant from foliar sprays of potassium and in those early uh, drought stress situations. So then we have some of those other characteristics of the plant surfaces themselves. Okay, the leaf shape, the, the leaf area index, these kinds of things. Leaf chemistry, I'm going to talk about it in a second. Um, and these are the physical attributes. What is the, the size of the thickness of the cuticle, the waxy layer on the outside of the leaf surface? What is the characteristic of that cuticle? Of course, it's waxy, it's, it has a water repellency, so different plants are more or less than others, as we all can appreciate with our brassicas. They have those, of course, leaf surfaces that the water will especially bead uh, together on those leaf surfaces, so hence wetter stickers to increase that spreadability are particularly relevant there. Um, so it's those cuticles, those surfaces can have a role, uh, these surface waxes. Also then the leaf structures, so leaf hairs, uh, the various kind of trichomes and these things can all impact on capturing the, leaf, uh, the foliar spray and either improving or limiting its uh, uh, reaching the target of those um, leaf surfaces. Crop stage is also a factor. Uh, young plants, uh, say around that kind of three to six leaf stage, those young leaves, very kind of young and tender leaves, are very responsive to a foliar spray. Of course, as that leaf gets more older, a bit more mature, it becomes a little bit less responsive. The nutrients are a little bit less penetrable into those slightly older leaves. So the young leaves at that early stage are very, very responsive to foliar sprays. And okay, I gave a few examples there of plant stresses as well, the drought stress, heat stress, these kinds of things also have, have a role. So therefore, we're thinking about the, the formulation, getting it applied out, reaching the target, then having an understanding of how those nutrients are absorbed and utilized by the plant then becomes another factor. So nutrients can get into the plant through these two means. One, as I just mentioned, is the stomata. So when the stomata are open, nutrients can be absorbed and taken up directly through that stomata. And that's also part of the reason that, again, early morning, late afternoon is particularly responsive for foliar sprays because those stomata are open. But nutrients can also be taken up through kind of micropores in the cuticles. They can pass through those waxy layers and be absorbed into the leaf surfaces. Now, contrary to root uptake of nutrients, the root, the plants, the root, the take up of nutrients from the soil by the roots involves energy. It's an active process. The plant has specific ion um, transporters, channels in the root cells, which enables the certain minerals to pass through that specific ion channel and be absorbed. And the plant is often using energy for that process to take up that mineral through that specific channel. Now, the leaf uptake of nutrients is quite different. It's more of a passive process. It's simply due to a concentration gradient. So the more concentration gradient we have on the outside of the leaf surface, i.e. what we've just foliar sprayed, if that is very strong and concentrated and the concentration of that nutrient is weaker, inside, uh, lower inside the tissue of the plant, well, we have a, a gradient there. And therefore, those nutrients will pass through the waxy cuticle into the plant due to that concentration gradient. So that's why it can be very effective to get nutrients into the plant very easily with not too much energy. It's a very passive process for them to take up those nutrients. And that also in, uh, highlights the importance of, of getting the spray formulation concentration correct, because if your foliar spray is too weak, too dilute, you're going to have a lower concentration gradient. So uptake will be slower. You won't get as good a response because your concentration gradient is smaller. So getting the right concentration of the foliar spray is, is critical to then creating a bigger gradient and quicker uptake and quicker utilization. It totally influences the, the speed of that response there. 
And so that comes down to the EC, uh, the concentration of our nutrient mix. Uh, we can use an EC meter uh, to measure that of the spray solution. Uh, you can see there around about one and a half to three millisiemens per cent centimeter is considered a good nutrient concentration of that foliar mix to then get a good absorption and uptake by the plant. So as well as a concentration gradient, for uptake, we have another means which is to do with the electrical potential, and this is to do with the charge of our mix and the charge of the plant. This is to do with cation and anion, bal uh, cation and anion balances. So whenever the plant takes up lots of, be it either anions or cations, depending on what we're applying, whenever it takes up particularly one of those, and if they are absorbed in different rates, this leads to an electrical gradient. If it's taking in lots of cations, for example, it's creating an electrical charge, an electrical gradient there, which then other nutrients can be absorbed to overcome that gradient as well. So it's also to do with cations and anions in the mix as well, as well as that concentration gradient. It's not, it's not purely that, it's also this electrical charge, because the plants always maintain a state of electroneutrality. They're, if they're taking in cations, they have to release cat other cations. This is part of what they do with the roots. When they take up acidifying mineral cations, they will release a hydrogen ion. When they take up anions, they will release a hydroxyl ion. There's this electroneutrality within the plant. And the same principle, that charge potential is a gradient in which we can, uh, which drives nutrient uptake from our foliar spray. And the plant surfaces themselves are negatively charged. So those waxy layers, that cuticle on the outside of the plant, that is a negatively charged surface. And so when we are applying certain nutrients, particularly cations, the positively charged nutrients, well, they can be highly attracted to those negatively charged surfaces. There is an attraction there, that positive and negative coming together. And so when we apply cations, uh, particularly it's so, we can often see a, somewhat like a bottleneck. We have this very negatively charged leaf surface. We apply all these cations as a strong attraction, we get this bottleneck effect there, and it can actually limit the uptake and the availability of the applied nutrient. And so we can help to bypass that issue by using things like chelators, and this is why you, I'm sure you've all come across chelated mineral product, foliar products, iron chelates, for example, etc for this very good reason, is that when we chelate them, which simply means combining them uh, with a, an agent, and okay, I'm gonna suggest we should be using carbon, but it could be all sorts of things, what that chelator does is neutralize the charge of that element. So it, it neutralizes it, therefore it can be absorbed into the plant more effectively, uh, because there's not so much of that strong uh, antag um, Antagon antagonistic strong charge attraction then. So this is a nice picture just to explain what I'm talking about here. If we are applying the nutrient, let's say here's our iron, this cation here for example, uh, we're applying this on its own, it's very strongly attracted to these negative surfaces, it kind of bottlenecks and doesn't get taken up very well. When we combine that with a chelator, and there are some carbon sources that are particularly effective at this, we, that's what we're doing right there. We're wrapping up that nutrient, we're satisfying, we're neutralizing that charge of the element. It's now attached to other things, we've neutralized that charge, therefore it's not such a bottleneck, it can more easily be actually taken up and absorbed by those leaf surfaces for utilization. Okay, so that is one of the golden rules every input that you're going out with, you should always be combining it with a source of carbon. It helps to chelate, it helps to stabilize, uh, it helps to buffer, all sorts of, helps improve uptake. I mean, you name it, there's lots and lots of good reasons why we should be doing that. So we can use, it could be as simple as things as molasses, cheap and easily to source as molasses. It's a carbon chain, it'll, it'll do this, it'll attach to things, that's great. Uh, we could use seaweeds, we could use fish extracts. We could use humic acids, we could use fulvic acids. And, and fulvic acid is one that's particularly effective for foliar sprays. Uh, that is one I particularly recommend because fulvic acid does exactly this, as you can see, as all of the other do, do the other carbon chelators. But fulvic acid also has another property about it. It makes the plant cells more permeable. So they actually become more receptive, more permeable to whatever is applied with that fulvic acid. And thereby you can improve nutrient uptake particularly so with fulvic. It works very, very good on, as a foliar carbon source. So I would particularly recommend that one in the instance of foliar sprays. 
So then the plants have taken up those minerals. Well, now they've got to utilize them, metabolize them, send them to where they're going, where they're required, etc. So, of course, different minerals have greater or less mobility. Some are more mobile, some are less mobile. So what we see is that our immobile nutrients, once absorbed into that leaf, they can typically they'll only have fairly local benefits, local effects to that leaf. They can't be sent around to elsewhere to other parts of the plant, unlike our mobile nutrients, which can have more of a systemic effect. They're taken up in certain leaves, but then redistributed throughout the plant to other leaves or other root, uh, root cell, other plant cells down to the roots, etc. So just two examples of that, both urea and boron are known to be highly absorbable, really easily to pass through that cuticle, be taken up by the plant. Urea is particularly effective um, and particularly easily absorbed by the plant, which also in a way makes urea also quite a good chelator. If you're looking for, if you're doing any foliar sprays of trace elements and things, for example, it's a really good idea to put just a touch of urea with that. It may only be a couple of kilos a hectare. Uh, but that urea then will bind to those trace minerals and because urea passes through the cuticle so easily, it helps to drag the other trace minerals in there with it. Particularly effective, with, for example, with zinc, but it, it works well with other traces as well. Anyway, point being, both of these two are taken up very easily. That nitrogen in the urea is highly mobile, can be easily distributed elsewhere, whereas the boron is highly immobile, so it only can stick around in that leaf where it has uh, more local, local benefits. So these things have a role, have an influence, and they can also be species-specific. So for example, fold replications of zinc, particularly in nut trees, that has been shown that the zinc is very immobile once it's taken up, whereas we know that zinc has reasonable mo mobility in other plants, like wheat, for example. It can move around. So they can be different behaviors in different plant species. So but nonetheless, it's a good general rule of thumb. And then we see that there's this sink source relationships between young and old leaves. So as plants are growing and developing, those young leaves are a sink for nutrition and for carbohydrates. As the young leaves are developing, they will receive sugars, carbohydrates, minerals from other leaves, from other parts of the plant. They will take those in and they will be a receiver. They will be a sink for those uh, sugars, etc. as that leaf is developing. But once that leaf has fully developed and fully matured, well, then it becomes a source. Then it is now fully functional. It's received all of the building blocks and mineral catalysts that it requires. Then it just photosynthesizes, photosynthesizes, and sends products out to the newer, now to the new leaves, those younger leaves, which are now that sink. So leaves, they transition from being this uh, young and old uh, sink source kind of relationship. Once a young leaf has become an old leaf, it can't actually take uh, carbohydrates and things back in. It can only be a sender of those. So there are these kind of different dynamics uh, within the plant, within those different mineral translocations there. So, okay, that's kind of part, seg part one. That's like just some fundamentals there on foliar spraying, uh, just some points to kind of consider in terms of getting a good response. Let's kind of move that into some fundamentals on plant nutrition, because uh, then we can try and bring these two things together at the end to talk about how to use an understanding of plant nutrition uh, and use an understanding of foliar techniques to optimize plant health. So, I mean, in a nutshell, we're going to go through each of these minerals just super quickly, one quick slide on each one. Again, we could do a whole nutrition, plant nutrition course probably for an entire day. If you guys want to stick around all night, we could keep going, but no, we won't do that. But we could talk about this for a whole day as fundamentals of plant nutrition. That's a big topic. So, again, I just want to touch over key points uh, for today, a few key take-home messages. So, in a super quick summary slide, uh, in a nutshell, what do different minerals do in the plant? This information helps us ch decide, make better management decisions on when to apply certain nutrients, what to apply, when to apply them, different crop stages. Understanding what they do in the plant helps us make better decisions around how to manage those minerals. So, in a whizzing through each of these, and we've got a slide on each to come. Nitrogen, it's involved in chlorophyll. It's structurally part of the chlorophyll molecule where photosynthesis happens. So we need nitrogen for good photosynthesis and of course for amino acids and proteins for DNA, of course, as well as another one. Phosphorus, it's part of ATP, this energy currency of the plant. It's driving all energy, all reactions, all processes in plants. They require energy just like we do. Phosphorus is the currency of that and it's particularly important for root development. As we all know, we use starter phosphorus for that reason. 
Potassium particularly plays a role in all sorts of catalyzing all sorts of reactions in the plant. It's one of these major enzyme, part of many, many enzyme systems, many, many ca um, kind of catalyst uh, systems. It also involves the movement of sugar, so the carrying of sugars and carbohydrates to the seed, to the fruit, etc. So it's really important for sizing up grain, sizing up seed, and also for nitrogen utilization, making protein. Calcium really important for cell wall strength. Magnesium, it's that other key mineral in the chlorophyll along with nitrogen, so we can't have good chlorophyll without magnesium. It's the central element. If we don't have good chlorophyll, we can't have good photosynthesis. Okay, we need the bu structural building blocks of that chlorophyll in order to photosynthesize and produce that, those sugars, carbohydrates, hormones, fats, oils, protective compounds, etc., etc. Sulfur also, as we know, very important as part of amino acids and therefore protein synthesis and nitrogen utilization. Also, like phosphorus, important for rooting development as well. Silicon, I'm going to say a brief mention on that one, really important for cell wall strength. Boron, anything to also to do with sugar movement around the plant, but anything to do with reproductive processes. Copper, disease protection. Zinc, leaf size. Manganese, also reproductive processes, seed um, development, etc. Iron is involved in the synthesis of chlorophyll. It's not structurally part of chlorophyll like nitrogen and magnesium are, but we need iron to bring that iron and magnesium together and form the chlorophyll. Iron is involved in the synthesis of that compound. Moly, really important for nitrogen utilization, converting nitrates into proteins. Cobalt, also for nitrogen fixation on legumes. And nickel, important for this particular enzyme, urease, which helps to utilize urea. Nickel is an essential plant nutrient essential plant nutrient. The plants cannot complete their life cycles without nickel. How many of us are managing nickel on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, I, I see a hand that's gone up. Impressive. <laughs> we have to chat later. So, in order to counteract the wrong way to think about plant nutrition, I'm going to whiz through each of these elements in no specific order, apart from we're not going to start with MPK, we're going to do them last. Let's start with the trace minerals, we'll move to the secondaries, and then we'll come down here just at the very, very end, just to emphasize that important point that they are all of equal importance, no one is more important than the other. No particular order here, though. Boron, okay, as I mentioned, it's a bit like calcium, it's like calcium and silicon, they all get deposited in the cell walls. It's become structurally part of the plant. That's why all three of them are highly immobile. Once they get deposited in there, they cannot be mobilized and utilized elsewhere. So it does have a role in increasing cell strength, and that helps to make the plant tougher, more rigid, uh, more um, resilient against invading attackers, pests and disease, for example. It's also involved, similarly, in the synthesis of these structural compounds, so things like lignans, polyphenols, these more complex carbon things, which get, again get deposited in the skin of the plant, helping to be a strength of the barrier between the outside world and the plant itself. It's a very immobile nutrient required in those growing tips, and as I mentioned, particularly important for reproductive processes. Any plants, any flowering plants that uh, flower, produce pollen, have to use um, pollen viability and set, that, set those flowers, fruit set, seed set, etc. Anything to do with that whole reproductive crop stage, boron is critical for almost under, unless there's an extreme toxic, known toxicity of boron, Pretty much most plants will benefit from a foliar spray of boron just prior to flowering, just at the onset of flowering, a week or so, moving into flowering. Uh, they really love that boron. It's really important for good flowering and reproductive um, processes. Uh, a few mineral uh, antagonists of boron, so calcium. Boron and calcium are synergists. They work together, but if one is too high or than the other, it can also begin to antagonize, so they kind of work both, actually, calcium and boron. Certainly nitrogen applications shut down boron, as does potassium. So these things, if we're over-applying these or we have too much of these in the soil in the system, they can antagonize the utilization of boron. For foliar sprays, we can use things like sodium borate, borate standard soluble, agricultural soluble boron is typically the best uh, easy source to use, boric acid. Like, as always, combine these with a source of carbon. Always put some carbon, especially with boron. Boron is an anticide, otherwise when it's raw, in that raw form, as we all know, we've used ant rid stuff in our kitchens, it's boric acid. Boron is, is an anticide. If we combine it with a carbon source, that buffers that negative effect on the ants. So again, it's actually a really important practice, generally. 
Copper, also important for, again, synthesis of these structural compounds, things like lignans, important to toughen up that skin of the plant, uh, but also copper has a role in the synthesis of defense chemicals, various antimicrobial type compounds, these secondary metabolites that can have uh, antifungal, antibiotic type properties, helping the immune system of the plant, helping the plant to uh, fight off pests and disease, particularly diseases. Of course, we associate copper with being foliar sprayed on, on the leaf surface, and that's really to sterilize the leaf surface. This is protection from disease from within the plant, from building structural defense barriers, and from synthesizing a, these immune compounds, very different from um, copper fungicides. Copper is also involved in the metabolism, utilization of proteins, of carbohydrates, and involved in various respiration processes of the plant. So phosphorus locks up calcium, it's a big antagonist. Again, nitrogen, and of course we can use standard copper sulfate there uh, as, a, as a perfectly good um, input to foliar correct copper deficiencies, again, with a source of carbon. What about zinc? It plays a role in determining leaf size. This is the solar panel of the plant. The leaf size depends on how, what surface area we can capture sunlight. And the more, of course, then we need those building blocks of nitrogen, magnesium, and chlorophyll in there. But zinc has an important role over the size of that solar panel. And the bigger the solar panel, the more sun and energy we can capture. Of course, the more energy we have to drive photosynthesis. It also plays a role in the synthesis of chlorophyll as well, a bit like iron. Uh, antagonists to zinc, high phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium, all three of these can shut down the utilization of zinc. Uh, we can also use zinc sulfate and zinc. We do see some zinc oxides in foliar use, but again, your sulfate form is typically better. It's more available, more easily to absorb and utilize by the plant. Manganese, important for germination. It also has a strong link with disease, an immune mineral for the plant. It really helps these disease-fighting processes, particularly because, again, similar process, it has a role in synthesizing these primary defenses, these structural barriers, but also these immune compounds from within the plant. A lot of diseases have a link with uh, manganese uh, deficiency. And there we go. It's involved in the producers of you know, lignans, these calluses, and then these other more antimicrobial, biotic type substances uh, within the plant. Uh, what antagonizes uh, manganese? Calcium is one. Potassium seems to be a synergist. It really helps um, manganese do its job. And again, manganese sulfate would be a typical option there, combined with carbon uh, for manganese. Iron. Uh, chlorophyll, as we touched on, that's its really big claim to fame, and that's really important for the synthesis of that chlorophyll. Uh, manganese and zinc uh, shut down the availability, as well as cal calcium and phosphorus. Potassium is a synergist, and here we have iron sulfate again. Uh, iron chelates also can be a good option, but iron sulfate works very well. Again, combine it with some fulvic acid. It's a very easy DIY chelator. It really helps the utilization of those minerals that it's combined with. Then we have moly, important for protein synthesis. Protein is, of course, what's helping to drive quality. We're all interested in protein. Uh, molybdenum is involved with two critical enzymes that help to convert nitrates into nitrite and then into ammonia before it ultimately becomes amino acids. So what I'm saying here is that we cannot build protein, we cannot convert nitrates into proteins without molybdenum. It is impossible. It is the key mineral. It's part of that molybdenum enzyme, nitrate reductase enzyme, that converts that nitrate ultimately into protein. It is an essential mineral for that process. What is the main form of nitrogen fertilizer we use in this country? Ammonium nitrate. That nitrate cannot be converted to proteins without moly. How many of us are managing moly, making sure we have enough moly? It's critically important. Okay, many high pH soils moly becomes very available. So a lot of UK soils uh, do certainly have adequate moly availability in them, but certainly not some of our acidic soils, and not necessarily always, just because your pH is high, doesn't guarantee that moly is coming up into the plant. So it is really important if we want to build amino acids, if we want to build protein, which I know I'm sure all of you want to do. But it's also really important for end fixing bacteria. They require moly to grab onto that nitrogen gas from the air. We, we like to talk about nutrition in the context of plants and essential plant minerals, and nutrition in the sense of animals, uh, minerals for livestock, and, and minerals for our diet. How often do we think about what minerals do the microbes need? 
the bacteria need Molly in order to grab onto nitrogen gas, pull that in from the air and deliver that to the plant. The bacteria cannot do it without Molly. As Dan was just talking about this also next door, uh, for those of you that were there. The bacteria need it, not just in our legumes, also the free living nitrogen fixes as well. They need that mineral. How, much, how often do we think about nutrition for our microbes? So, okay, we can use also sodium molybdate would be the most common uh, foliar spray there that we can also use uh, to correct moly deficiencies. Cobalt, another essential mineral, for, particularly for legumes, so they need it for nodule formation, so it's essential in our legumes, and it's part of vitamin B12. Uh, it is the central element to this vitamin. Uh, what does that do? I should say vitamin, shouldn't I? I'm just getting these things constantly mixed around now. I'm just traveling too much. I can never be aubergine or eggplant, vitamin, vitamin, yogurt, yogurt. It just never ends. I can, as soon as I get used to one, I'm somewhere else, and then I... Forget. Okay, so vitamin B12, um, it has a role in cell division. For all cells, microbes need cobalt too to divide their cells. So do, so do plants, so do, of course, so do animals, so do we. It's critically important. So we can use cobalt sulfate there for that one. Okay, nickel, as I mentioned, uh, it is a part of this enzyme called urease. What does that do? It helps to break apart the urea molecule. It helps with the utilization, the hydrolysis, the utilization of urea, turning that ultimately into proteins, amino acids and proteins. So nickel is also an essential mineral. I think there's a lot of scope there uh, for utilization, foliar spraying of urea with nickel. Uh, bringing these two synergies together, applying that urea in a form directly into the plant, which is basically like a pre-amino acid. It can very easily be converted into proteins, uh, particularly if it has the mineral synergies like nickel there to support that process. Put that same urea down into the soil. It's many of that, much of that can volatilize off. Some might get converted to nitrates, leach away, then the plant's taking up those nitrates then it has to use a lot of energy to convert those nitrates into proteins. Whereas if we foliar spray that urea, it's a pre-amino acid. It's very easy, very super energy efficient to go amino acid protein. Or we can put that urea in the soil and then we start the chain down here. It has to start from nitrates, work its way up back to get to amino acid to then become protein. Or we can just interject right here. And that's what urea definitely through the foliar has great potential <clears throat> for that reason. It really helps to enhance quality from a protein perspective. Okay, that's trace minerals. And then moving on to the secondary macro minerals, calcium, as I touched on, really important in cell walls along with boron and silicon, uh, and that is a cell strengthener. It helps to toughen up the rigidity of those plants, and that helps to improve pest and disease resistance. It is a highly immobile mineral for that exact reason. Once the calcium gets deposited in these cell walls, it is structurally part of the plant, structurally locked in. It cannot be remobilized and, and reutilized. It is there for good. So we know some of the antagonists, the big ones, MPK, all three of those antagonize calcium availability. And this is why we classically see in a lot of early establishing crops, which have had too much MPK down at the beginning on the planting blend, all three of those block calcium availability and uptake. We will often see yeah, great establishment, fast, quick, spindly growth, but it's thin, watery growth. It's not strong structural rigid plant tissues, and that's because calcium cannot keep up when we're pushing MPK too much. The calcium is the big loser from that approach. So if we optimize calcium in the tissues, we can feel it. It's more uh, rigid, tougher, uh, leatherier plant, so to speak. Okay, and the other big one is magnesium, as we know. Magnesium and calcium are classic antagonists. Uh, boron does work with um, calcium, as does silicon. What can we use for inputs? Calcium nitrate, calcium chloride, liquid limes, liquid gypsums, these kinds of things uh, can all be used to address uh, calcium. What about sulfur? We've touched on sulfur a little bit earlier. We all appreciate its role in amine to the critical amino, essential amino acids, and therefore it's very important for that overall protein synthesis. If you're interested in protein, you've got to be interested in moly. You've got to be interested in sulfur. We've got to have the synergists, the nutrients that support nitrogen in doing what it does. We're all interested in nitrogen, but we should all be interested in the other minerals that support nitrogen in doing what it does, in driving yield, in building protein, etc. 
Sulfur also really important for root development, like phosphorus, very important for nodule formation in our legumes, uh, and also sulfur has a role in disease resistance, sulfur-induced disease resistance. So sulfur-rich plants typically have higher levels of inherent immunity against disease. Uh, antagonists, zinc and moly, both antagonize sulfur. Uh, sel selenium seems to be uh, quite a synergist there. It's linked with selenium as a part of the selenomethionine, one of those amino acids as well. Uh, what can we use for sulfur? We can use ammonium sulfate, potassium sulfate, mag sulfate. All three of those are perfectly fine. And as we've touched on, any of those trace mineral sulfates already, they're going to be bringing some sulfur into the system. Magnesium, as I mentioned, part of that chlorophyll, central of the chlorophyll, central element in the chlorophyll molecule, cannot have good photosynthesis without that chlorophyll. But actually, only about 15 to 20 percent of the total magnesium in the plant is actually structurally part of the chlorophyll molecule. The far majority is actually used as an enzyme, as a catalyst to catalyze all sorts of processes, particularly nitrogen, uh, sorry, protein synthesis, utilization of nitrogen as well. Much lesser known, there's quite a focus on the importance of magnesium for chlorophyll, and it is really important, but actually it also plays a really important role in nitrogen utilization. And it's also a phosphorus uh, synergist. Uh, calcium, as we mentioned, shuts it down. Potassium shuts it down. Potassium and magnesium have that classic relationship. Seesawing is one's too high, the other one's down. If the other one's too high, the other one's down. Uh, they are classic uh, antagonists. Uh, phosphorus and nitrogen help magnesium work better. Uh, mag sulfate, mag nitrate, or micronized magnesite there as well. Silicon, as I've just quickly mentioned, it's not an essential mineral, but it is very beneficial. It also deposits in the cell walls like calcium, like boron, so it helps with structurally protecting the plant against disease, but it also has this other effect in terms of inducing resistance, being a mineral that can enhance and support and drive immune responses within the plant helping the plant to fight off uh, insects and disease. A lot of very interesting research being done on silicon. I encourage you to go do some Googling on that. Whatever crop you grow, whatever your crop of interest, just go into Google and type in silicon, nutrition, and whatever, wheat, canola, etc. Uh, there's a lot, just so much really interesting information out there uh, on that mineral. Okay, um, potassium, important for sizing, translocation of sugars and carbohydrates, as I mentioned, sizing up those fruit. Therefore, when we are carrying sugars and carbohydrates to fruit, grain, seed, but especially fruit, that improves the taste, the flavor of the uh, product, improves the ripeness, the size, the flavor, all those quality attributes. It also has a role in protein synthesis. It is a highly, also a highly, highly mobile mineral. That means we will typically see deficiency symptoms on those older leaves. Calci so all of the other major cations are antagonists, so calcium, magnesium, and sodium, nitrogen also. Silicon actually works very synergistically with potassium. They form a compound that really helps uh, the potassium be utilized into the plant. And we have all sorts of options here, pot chloride, potassium sulfate, potassium nitrate, potassium silicate. So you're getting those two synergists there in one, also a really good option. Phosphorus, as I mentioned, ATP, energy currency of the plant. Phosphorus also has a role in accelerating tissue maturity. So that's important for, as we often hear, or yeah, these young plant tissues are more susceptible and sens uh, susceptible to pests and disease. Uh, phosphorus has a role in hardening off those young tissues, helping them to mature, uh, making the plant, of course, a bit more resistant. And again, root development, as we mentioned, very important for crop establishment. Uh, antagonists of phosphorus, calcium, iron, zinc, aluminium. So these, particularly some of these guys, of course, lock up with that phosphorus, forming these insoluble, unavailable compounds. Uh, magnesium helps to improve mag uh, phosphorus availability. And then from a foliar perspective, we have all sorts of various phos acids, MKP, monopotassium phosphate, that's a good one. Get a bit of potassium and phosphorus. Really helps to drive photosynthesis there. That is a good foliar, uh, uh, quick corrector of phosphorus deficiency in plants and some of these other micronosed rock minerals and things as well can be used, but they are better down in the soil. Uh, okay, then we have nitrogen, big driver of yield, big driver of protein, structurally part of the plant in terms of the DNA, part of that chlorophyll, the cytophotosynthesis, etc. 
And again, the problem with nitrogen is that when we overapply it without those supporting minerals, it's about bringing those other minerals with nitrogen in order to do its job. Thinking about potassium's role, molybdenum's role, sulfur's role, bringing these minerals together, magnesium, to jo join up that nitrogen to form that chlorophyll. It's about bringing those minerals together with our nitrogen, is how we should be thinking about nitrogen management. So there's, there's some of those synergies there, moly, nickel, sulfur. Uh, we could use urea, it's particularly my favorite, as I mentioned, through the foliar spray, ammonium sulfate, calcium nitrate, okay, amino acids, fish, these kinds of things also can help us supply nitrogen. Okay, that was just super quick whizzing through them all, and then a few quick summary slides now. So this is what we're talking about. It's about bringing all of those minerals together to understand this process to deliver the foliars can be a, a quick and effective way to deliver those minerals into the plant to drive this process, to drive plant health, yield, quality, etc., etc. Well, what about plant immunity? How does the plant fight off diseases? Can you recognize the similarity in this slide at all? It's the exact same slide. All I'm saying is, however, again, we need minerals and catalysts to drive this process, but the plant can also synthesize all of these other interesting secondary compounds, antimicrobials, antibiotics, these phytochemicals, physical barriers, protective compounds, proteins. All of these things help the plant be less attractive, be less susceptible to, um, uh, to insect invading insect attack. The plant has an immune system. It can fight off disease, but it requires the adequate delivery and supply of the mineral catalysts in order to drive its immune system. And when we have any limitation here, we will have a compromised immune system. And this is the principle of plant health. This is why when we optimize the nutritional balance in the plant, the plants will be inherently healthy. What about insects? Same slide again. What else can the plant synthesize from that original simple sugar, that original building block? Ah, other bitter compounds, antifeedants, they have anti-herbivory type properties, again, cell strengtheners, deterrent chemicals, these volatile compounds that uh, attract in beneficials or deter the insect pests, complex things, proteins that the insects can't digest, these protective compounds, these defense chemicals. The plant can synthesize a whole range of defense chemicals against insects as well. But again, they require the minerals to act as catalysts in order to fuel this inherent immune process. It all comes down to good plant nutrition. And there are some really fundamental basics that we're not getting right in our standard practices today, uh, which work directly against this process. It's simply a matter of saying, well, okay, what is my leaf status? Ask the plant, do some tissue tests, do some visual observations, do some SAP tests, try and diagnose the issues and then correct them. And foliars can be a very quick way of correcting those. And then we link this to soil health and soil processes. When we deliver minerals, when plants have adequate minerals, and this process all works, this one here, and we're develop, um, building more uh, diversity and more complexity into the plant, well, what happens to all of these various compounds, these sugars, carbohydrates, all of these kinds of things? Well, a percentage of those gets sent down to the root system and exuded out of the root system to feed the soil microbes. Here we have a lovely picture of a root exudate coming off uh, some maize here. And so the plant is leaking these products of photosynthesis, these various things here. It is leaking those out into the soil to deliver those to feed the soil community, the soil microbial community, so that those microbes can cycle minerals, um, make nutrients available and deliver those back to the plant. Now, if we were to calculate back the amount of nutrients that we apply in a foliar spray, it's actually very small. If you calculate particularly trace minerals, if we calculate that back per hectare, we're talking an insignificant amount of nutrients I'm foliar spraying over, over all of your canopy. It's insignificant. But what does the plant do with that? It primes the plant, it delivers that mineral, it primes the plant to trigger this process. And then those 30 odd percent, sometimes 50 odd percent of the products get sent down, the carbon is exuded out to feed soil biology. When that happens, and we feed those organisms in the soil food web, well, what do they do? They, of course, solubilize minerals from the soil and they make those minerals available back to the plant. They cycle nutrients, and they deliver those nutrients back to the plant. So when we foliar spray that tiny little bit of trace mineral, 
All we've done is prime the pump, prime the plant, triggered the release of those rutexidates, woken up the biology, stimulated nutrient cycling and nutrient release and nutrient delivery to the plant from the soil. So that foliar spray was actually more about an indirect stimulation of the soil life than it was about the amount of nutrient that you actually put in. The response that you see, the greening up that you see, for example, has come from the fact that you woke up biology and cycled nutrients from the soil. It wasn't the little amount that you put on the top. That was just a primer. And so the plant, how long does this take? This is why foliars are so useful. We can foliar spray those nutrients in. Uh, they will catalyze this process. The plant will start breathing in that carbon dioxide, fixing that, turning that into sugars, carbohydrates. How long does that take to send those down to the root system and exude those out as the root system? It can be as quick as one hour in ryegrass. In, uh, rye this has been shown. Uh, one hour after we get those minerals into the plant, we can start feeding soil biology through these root exudates, cycling that nutrient. And that's what it's all about. It's about releasing those uh, foods down here, bringing carbon into the system, driving this food web so that they eat carbon, cycle nutrients, eat each other, cycle nutrients, spit all of that around, cycle that around, and deliver that back to the plant. And so that's what it is. That's what good foliar management and plant nutrition is all about, optimizing plant health for plant health's sake, but also so that as we optimize this process, we actually improve soil health through better plant nutrition. Plants drive soil health too. So in summary, pros and cons to foliar sprays. On the pro side, we have very rapid utilization. Okay? The plants can absorb those minerals if they're in the right form and we apply them correctly and get them through those cuticles, etc. They can absorb that rapidly and utilize that rapidly, much faster than soil applied nutrients. So if we have a deficiency symptom, we can also alleviate that symptom quicker through the foliar spray. And if you can see a visual symptom, you're already losing some productivity. So we want to correct that as quickly as possible, of course. So we can do that quicker through a foliar. It can be more effective for soil applications, uh, particularly for certain nutrients that are often highly immobilized, or those particularly reactive nutrients like nitrogen, which can, we can easily lose them from the system. So we can be more effective in delivering those nutrients to the plant. Uh, less runoff nutrient losses. Uh, for example, the example I just gave you there, nitrates. So we can, again, more targeted, losing less from the system through the soil. Uh, we can also deliver minerals to the plant when its ability to draw nutrition from the soil has been impaired in those early drought examples that I gave you earlier, early drought conditions. Uh, we can actually deliver plants, uh, minerals to the plant effectively there. Things like trace minerals where we're using such small amounts per hectare anyway, you can actually get more even spread, more even delivery of those trace minerals compared to soil applied. So it certainly has that advantage in a liquid form and we can use foliars to top up plant growth, top up plant health during key crop stages or certainly peak demand. Example, boron prior to flowering, for example, um, using our knowledge of plant nutrition uh, and crop stage and bringing that together. On the negative side, okay, there is an upper limit to how many units per hectare we can apply through the foliar spray. Of course, we can't get as much out there through the foliar as we can through the soil. Certainly the plants, because it's so rapidly absorbed and utilized, we typically see shorter term benefits. There may be a need to re-deliver those minerals if, the, if there was quite a drastic deficiency and we didn't correct it in one hit, the plants utilize it quickly, uh, there may be a need to repeat that. Uh, some might say that would be a negative, a bit of extra labor component there. Okay, certainly uh, people feel that they see very variable responses to foliar sprays. And okay, we've touched on some of the reasons why that may be, some of the application to technologies, tricks that we can use to optimize delivery and uptake of that plant. So using some of the things we've discussed today, that we can help to minimize that negative. Uh, sure, there's a possibility of burning if our solution is too concentrated and we are restricted by the weather. Of course, if it's windy, if it's wet, we can't get out there and deliver those minerals. So it certainly it has an environmental drawback as well. So in summary, foliars cannot replace a good uh, soil management, good soil fertility strategy. It should be designed to complement, to go with. It's a good short-term strategy whilst we focus on good long-term soil health improvement strategies. They do work together in those different 
uh, time frames, thinking fast and thinking slow. We can really enhance our nutrient use efficiency, so there's small amounts of nutrients. It's very targeted. This is very effective. This is very efficient. Okay, as I say on the negative, we're limited by how much we can get in, but certainly it improves our efficiencies there, particularly in relation to minimizing envir negative environmental outpack, impacts, Leach leaching of nitrates, for example, uh, loss of phosphorus, eutrophication of waters, etc. these kinds of examples. So if we can understand some of the basics of plant nutrition, Plant Nutrition 101, what we've kind of touched through today, uh, this can help us make better management decisions, better targeted decisions on what to apply and when, what form, these kinds of things. Use tissue tests, use your eyes in the field, do some plant health assessments, try and diagnose the correct mineral deficiency uh, to determine what is the best input uh, to apply. So top tips to get that response. In summary, make sure we get the correct identification. It has to start with the right mineral that we require. That's the key first step. Think about what the mixture, the formulation that we're going to apply, what is the concentration of that is particularly important. But think about chelators, carbon, think about wetter stickers, the spreadability, the surface tension, sticking that solution, all of that is also very important, of course. But certainly always combine it with a carbon source. It can help to buffer, improve uptake and chelate, etc. Uh, we talked about humidity, so early morning and late afternoon where possible. And I know there's a practical hurdle there, sometimes you can't do that. But Ideal circumstance, that's what you're looking for. And then long-term soil health improvement has to be part of the strategies. Foliar sprays is not just about foliar sprays full stop. It's about that as just a piece of the puzzle, as a longer-term as a longer term and bigger picture strategy of improving plant and soil health. Because the more we improve plant health in the short term, we can improve soil health in the long term through the delivery of those root exudates, through stimulating soil biology and keeping them active and thriving. Fundamentals as to why keeping green plants, keeping the soil covered is a fundamental soil health principle. So they have to go together. Let's not separate them off. Bring them together in a combined strategy for soil and plant. OK, there we go. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, a few minutes over. Sorry, Paul. Guys, are, yeah, well, he's a complete hero, as I said he would be. Um, I can't believe there are any questions, but I mean, we've got the mic. We're up, up for it, so. Everyone just wants a beer. There we go. <coughs> uh, hopefully a quick one. Just talking. Yeah, uh, <coughs> No, to use the mic, yeah, because oh, everyone okay. else can hear. Um, in terms of uh, making that identification of what nutrient is your limiting factor, are there particular resources that you recommend? Mm -hmm. um, the best, the gold standard, really, the best way is to do a, a full tissue analysis and send it off to a lab. Um, that way you, you know, um, you get a defin definitive answer. It is the best way. Uh, alternatively, I mean, if you want to do some of your own visual assessments, Google is a great resource. Type in wheat or whatever your crop you grow and deficiency symptoms, and you'll bring into in Google Images. You know, you'll bring up all sorts of images that can potentially help you there. So that is a great resource to help with diagnosis. And then there are also a range of kind of sap, I didn't really talk about them today, but a range of kind of plant health sap meters where you can, you can extract some, pull some leaves, extract some sap and, and do some direct measurements right there in field immediately. So um, look up kind of sap meters, plant nutrition sap meters. They can also be a useful tool. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Just wait, 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 wait. Here we go. I don't mind. <laughs> Hello. Uh, do you have much on applying some of these foliar feeds along with herbicides? Because some of the herbicides we apply are like chemotherapy almost, something to mm. help out the plant. Uh, yeah, so certainly you can mix certain um, minerals just to be efficient with your herbicide and okay, do two, two things at once. Um, so there can be some antagonisms there. I, I, I couldn't comment. You'd have to really ask the, the chemical manufacturer there on that. But, but certainly it's commonplace to include a bit of extra nutrition, kill two birds with one stone. It can be very effective, yes. Um, what I would also say is definitely include a source of carbon if you're putting herbicides out. The fulvic acid that I mentioned definitely include um, some carbon buffering there to, to also help. And also um, pH of the spray solution. It depends on what chemical you're applying, but every single chemical has an optimum pH, spray pH, in which the active ingredient is most effective. 
It doesn't say that on the label it should. If, you're, if you want to send me an email, I have a chart which has a huge range of chemicals on there and what their ideal pH is. Uh, so you can look that up and tweak the pH of your overall spray solution so that the active ingredient will be more effective. When you do that and combine it with things like carbon and fulvic acid that I mentioned, for example, you can also improve efficiencies and potentially be winding down some of your application rates. But, um, but yep, otherwise, yeah, trace minerals, can, um, or certain nutrients, minerals can certainly go with herbicides. There's a lot of work that's looked at things like combining it with ammonium sulfate or urea. There's certainly good evidence that shows that they can enhance the effectiveness of the herbicide as well. Hello, I have two questions, but one of which from the first question. If you're doing a tissue analysis, mm -hmm. um, you've got some micronutrients which are mobile and some which are immobile. Mm -hmm. Surely, which part of the plant? I mean, um, it does make a difference, doesn't it? It sure does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, ask the second question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, do it first. Yeah. Um, I also live in an area where very high pH and phosphate lockup is mm -hmm. a big problem. Um, how can, I mean, some of the growers I'm working with are using yeah. Um, how can we help free up some low phosphate in the soils, mine that phosphate? How can we what, sorry? Just free up some oh, free phosphate. Oh, free up, okay, sure, yeah, okay. Thank you. All right, yeah, so you, um, you've hit the bullseye there with your point about mobility and which leaf to sample. It's a, it is a bit of a big oversight with how we um, manage tissue tests, uh, certainly. So the standard wisdom is to sam we do sample the kind of the youngest but fully mature leaf. So that's not the growing tips, but you know, perhaps just a bit behind that, the youngest but still fully formed leaf. Uh, that is the one that we sample, and that is the one based on many years of, of research and database and, and cataloging and trial work. We have a picture of what the ideal level in that leaf should be, or a bit of a range at least. Now, um, so that, that has value, that has a lot of historical um, data set behind that, and that's, that's great, but it does highlight a, a bit of an issue with some particularly mobile minerals, whereby um, some of the particularly the mobile ones, let's say potassium is a good example, if the plant comes into a deficiency, it can actually take minerals from those older leaves and send them up to the new growth areas, and then you come along and sample that leaf. Uh, so, of course, you may actually have a deficiency, therefore, of that mineral in the older leaf, uh, but you, when you've sampled it on the new growth area, it says that it's okay. And th that is certainly an oversight of the system, so the tissue tests also have strengths and weaknesses, like every test, um, and that's about, therefore, being mindful of that. So, it, it, you know, that, that is an example where there's an issue, but more generally, the protocol of tissue testing, based on the historical evidence of what that mineral should be, is still very valuable. So don't let that take, don't let its weakness also take it away from it, that it does have value. Um, so you've just got to factor that in, unfortunately, and that comes with just a bit of knowledge on more plant nutrition, etc. Um, then your other question is, yeah, I agree, I think th those kind of examples of high phosphorus in the soil, or high um, lock-up of the soil, these issues, it makes no sense to put more of the mineral in the soil. It's already probably there in sufficient quantities, it's just locked up. And that's where, again, foliars can be a very useful and effective kind of short-term remedy uh, towards that, and I would think that's a great strategy, fully support that. However, you've got to combine with that a long-term strategy of, okay, well, how do I release what's there? And really that then comes down to good soil health practices. I mean, it's got to be around, centered around good organic matter, organic carbon. The more carbon we can get into the soils, the more biological function we see. What those various bacteria and fungi do, they're great at solubilizing minerals from the soil and delivering to them, them to the plant. So we've characterized a huge plethora actually of what's called phosphorus solubilizing microbes. And there's many species of bacteria that do that. There's many species of fungi that do that. You can buy commercial products out there which, are, which have strains of those specialist solubilizing microbe uh, species. 
that are commercialized products, for example, um, because we, we, that's one of the groups of microbes that are very well characterized. So there is lots of microbes that can cycle that. Mycorrhizal fungi would also be a particularly important one there. So part of the long-term answer then to your question is increasing soil microbial activity and enabling those microbes to solubilize and liberate the, nutri the nutrients there from the soil. And the key to that is more plant diversity and more carbon coming into the system. One. Yeah. Joel, you if maybe possibly answer this, but if you're allergic to mechanization sprayers, can you put minerals through a water system for mob grazing cattle? Would that work being ingested by cattle and put out the back end, so to speak? Uh, so do you, do you mean fully spraying the grass before the cattle graze it? Is that what you mean? No, I mean dropping the you mineral shortfall into a water tank or into their tank. drinking water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> you could do. I mean, that's the same as mineral lick blocks, uh, essentially. You're just talking about it in a liquid form rather than a, a solid form. Yeah, they're going to eat those minerals, process it with the grass that they eat and poop it back out and redistribute that mineral throughout the rest of the field. So, so yes, it can be an effective strategy to try and address limitations. Um, I'm not familiar with doing it in a liquid form, but I guess there's no reason why not. You just maybe you'd have to be mindful of whatever the... Do the concentration is the dose, so it's not maybe too much and causing some issues with their metabolism, but uh, in theory, if you're supplying the mineral in a liquid form or a lick block, there's no difference really there. So, yeah, it, haven't heard of it, but yeah, I, I could see the potential potentially there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Joel, a few questions. Um, I'm working with some farmers in Ireland uh, applying liquid urea onto pastures mm -hmm. in an effort to reduce nitrogen use. Um, would you see molasses as being a cost-effective carbon source for application with liquid urea? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would, um, definitely. Uh, I think I, I'd say, as I mentioned, the fulvic acid, humic or fulvic acid, particularly fulvic, is really good for the foliar because of that permeability, plant cell permeability function. So I think it does work better, and fulvic acid has more exchange sites, higher CEC, more exchange sites to grab onto, to chelate and wrap up and grab onto that mineral. So you can use less of it, you've got more exchange sites. So it would be a bit more effective in that regard, but in terms of something cheaper and easily accessible, sure, molasses can also work very well. Yeah. Is there any compounds that can be used when, when plants are in the early stages of stress to maximize flow through the pores or even open the pores back up again to nearly trick the plant into thinking uh, it's not stressed so open the pores to get the nutrients in. Is there anything we mm. can use to help in those early st stages, be it drought or be it in, in periods of weather? weather? Yeah, well certainly um, for drought stress, so I, I mean I mentioned potassium there as one mineral that really helps the plant to overcome drought stresses and Potassium also has a direct role in the opening and closing of the stomata as well, part of sodium potassium pumps. So certainly potassium is a very good um, stress reliever mineral for those kinds of drought stress situations and it also helps the plant to open up uh, stomata. The other mineral that is excellent for the master stress reliever is silicon, as I mentioned. That one also helps the plant with you named the stress, silicon works. Drought, temperature, frost, cold, salinity, so dicity, heavy metals, microbe, insect, you name it, silicon helps uh, the plant with those stressful situations. So that would definitely also be another one. And then the other strategy is the idea of combining minerals, nutri foliar nutrients, with microbial products. So one of the benefits there of applying microbes uh, through the foliar means uh, is that those microbes breathe, they respire. So they're breathing in that oxygen, they're releasing CO2. So when you coat the leaf surfaces with beneficial bacteria, and there are all sorts of kind of microbe type things you could brew up and culture, so in compost extracts, teas, these kinds of things would be one example, but there'd be many others. What that microbe is doing when it coats that leaf surface and is applied, it's respiring, it's releasing CO2, and the plant detects that and it makes the plant open its stomata to breathe in that CO2. So when you combine nutrition with biology in the one mixture, 
then the, the microbes trigger CO2 and um, stomata opening, and then that also enables the nutrient to get in and be utilized and delivered to the plant more effectively as well. So that would also be another strategy to trick the plant into opening its stomata if it detects a swathe of CO2 in the, in the uh, environment. And sorry, one final question. And um, uh, yourself included, a lot of speakers have spoken about and we've seen at home the importance of sulfur mm -hmm. and applying sulfur. And we have farmers applying uh, uh, liquid uh, sulfur slurry onto, onto soil as a soil drench. I'm wondering, is humates or is there, again, some like carbon source that will reduce um, leaching of sulfur in soil? Is there something we can use to help keep that sulfur longer in, in, mm -hmm. in, in the soil over the yeah, the answer there is carbon. It has to be carbon, so sulfur is an anion, of course, so it can't be held on the clay surfaces, uh, the sands and silts. It can only be held by the organic fractions in the soil, the humus, the, the carbon. So the answer is, yeah, you've got to build more organic matter in your soil, build more humus, and again, it would be things like humates or humic acids, forms of carbon, which can then hold on to those negatively charged nutrients and keep them in the root zone. So yes, that, that would be the strategies there to use. It's all about carbon to hold on to sulfur.